Hi everybody. This is me in my basement, and I'm going to read a book. One little story that you can just listen to, even though you probably already have heard me read this before, read it in class. I figured uh, it'd be worth listening to again because a lot of people liked it. And it's short, it only takes me about a half hour to read it. So uh, it's called Love is a Fallacy by Max Shulman updated version. Uh, it was a book that came out in the 20s, and so I updated some of the language to make it more reader-friendly. Here we go. Cool was I, and logical. Keen, calculating, intelligent, acute, I was all of these. My brain was as powerful as a rocket, precise as a chemist's scales, as penetrating as a surgeon's scalpel. And think of it, I was only 18. It is not often that one so young has such a giant intellect. Take, for example, P.D. Birch, my roommate at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> same age, same background, dumb as an ox. Nice enough guy, but nothing upstairs. Emotional type, impressionable unstable. Worst of all, he was into all the latest fads in clothing. Clothing fads, I submit, are the very negation of reason. To be swept up in every new craze that comes along, to surrender oneself to idiocy just because everybody else is doing it? <laughs> Foolishness. But not to Petey. <laughs> One afternoon I found him lying on his bed with an expression of such distress and pain on his face that I immediately diagnosed he must have appendicitis. Don't move, I said. I'll get a doctor. Raccoon, he mumbled thickly. Raccoon, I said, pausing in my flight. I want a raccoon coat, he wailed. I perceived that his trouble was not physical. His trouble was mental. Why do you want a raccoon coat? I asked. I should have known it, he cried, pounding his temples. I should have known they'd come back into style. Like an idiot, I spent all my money on textbooks for my classes, and now I can't get a raccoon coat. Can you mean, I said incredulously, the people are actually wearing raccoon coats again? All the big men on campus are wearing them. Where have you been? In the library, I said with a smirk. He leaped from the bed and paced the room. I've got to have a raccoon coat, he said passionately. I've just got to. Petey, why? Look at it rationally. Raccoon coats are unsanitary. They smell bad. They're unsightly. <laughs> they weigh too much. They... You don't understand, he interrupted impatiently. It's the thing people are doing. Don't you want to be cool? No, I said truthfully. Well, I do, he declared. I'd give anything for a raccoon coat. Anything! Now my brain, that precision instrument, slipped into high gear. Anything? I asked, looking at him narrowly. Anything! He affirmed in ringing tones. I stroked my chin thoughtfully. It so happened that I knew where to get my hands on a raccoon coat. My father had had one back in the 70s. It lay now in the trunk in an attic back home. It also happened that Petey had something I wanted. Well, he didn't have it exactly, but at least he had first rights to it. I'm referring to his girlfriend, Polly Epsy. I had long liked Polly. But let me emphasize, my desire for this young woman was not purely emotional in nature. No, she was beautiful, <laughs> to be sure. But I was not one to let my heart rule my head. I wanted Polly for a very calculated, entirely intellectual reason. You see, I was a freshman in law school. In a few years, I'd be out in practice. I was well aware of the importance of the right kind of wife in furthering a lawyer's career. The successful lawyers I had noticed were almost all married to beautiful, 
graceful, intelligent women. Polly fitted these specifications perfectly. Well, all but one. Beautiful? She was. Graceful? She was. Intelligent? She was not. In fact, she kind of veered in the opposite direction, if you know what I'm saying. But I figured, under my expert guidance, she'll smarten up. That's worth a try, at least. Petey, I said, are you in love with Polly? I like hanging out with her, he said, but I don't think you'd call it love. Why? Well, do you two, I asked, have any kind of a formal arrangement? I mean, you like officially boyfriend and girlfriend or engaged or anything like that? No. No. We see each other quite a bit, but we both still date other people. Why? Is there, I asked, any other guy that she really likes? Not that I know of. Why? I nodded with satisfaction. In other words, if you were out of the picture, she'd be fair game, right? I guess so. What are you even getting at? Nothing. Nothing. I said innocently and took my backpack out of the closet. Where are you going? said Petey. Home for the weekend. I threw a few things into my bag. Listen, he said, clutching my arm eagerly. While you're home, you couldn't get some money from your old man, could you? You know, lend it from your dad and then give it to me or even lend it to me so I can buy a raccoon coat? I may do even better than that, I said with a mysterious wink, and closed my backpack and left. Look, I said to Petey when I got back Monday morning. I threw my open backpack down and revealed the huge, hairy object that my father had worn, I don't know, back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Awesome, said Petey excitedly. He plunged his hands into the raccoon coat and then his face into it. Awesome! He repeated about 15 or 20 times. Would you like it? I asked. Heck yeah! He cried, clutching the greasy animal pelt to his face. Then a strange look came into his eyes. What do you want for it? Your girlfriend, I said, mincing no words. Polly? He said in a horrified whisper. You want Polly? That's right. He shook his head. I shrugged. Okay. If you don't want to be one of the big men on campus, one of the guys who know what's going on, I mean, it's your business. I mean, I guess being cool doesn't mean that much to you, you know? I sat down in a chair and pretended to read a book, but out the corner of my eye I kept watching Petey. <laughs> he was a torn man. First he looked at the child, at the coat, with the expression of a hungry child at a bakery window. And then he turned away and set his jaw resolutely. Hmm. Then he looked back at the coat, with even more longing in his face. Then he turned away but not so resolutely this time. Back and forth, his head swiveled. Finally, he didn't even turn away. He just stood and stared with mad desire at the coat. It's not like I'm in love with Polly, he said thickly. Or going steady or anything like that. That's right, I murmured. What's Polly to me, or me to Polly? Not a thing, said I. It's just been hanging out, having some fun. I mean, that's really all. Try on that coat, said I. He complied. The coat bunched high over his ears and dropped all the way down to his shoe tops. The dude looked like a mound of dead raccoons. It fits perfect, he said. <laughs> I rose from my chair. Is it a deal? I asked, 
extending my hand. He swallowed. It's a deal, he said, and shook my hand. I had my first date with Polly the next evening. This was kind of in the nature of a survey. I wanted to find out just how much work I had to do to get her mind up to the standard I required. I took her first to dinner. That was a totes delish dinner, she said as we left the restaurant. And then I took her home. I had an awesome time, she said as she bade me good night. I went back to my room with a heavy heart. I had gravely underestimated the size of my task. This girl's lack of information was terrifying. It wouldn't even be enough to give her information. No. For she had to be taught how to think. This loomed as a project of no small dimensions. And at first I was tempted to give her back to Petey. But then I got thinking about her abundant charms. And I decided I would make an effort. I went about this, as I go about all things, systematically. I gave her a course in logic. See, it so happened that I, as a law student was taking a course in logic myself, so I had all the facts right at my fingertips. Polly, I said to her when I picked up on our next date, tonight we're going over to the Knoll and talk. Whew, fun, she said. One thing I will say for Polly, she's certainly agreeable. We went to the Knoll, the campus trysting place, and sat down under an old oak. She looked at me expectantly. What are we going to talk about? She said. Logic. She thought about this for a moment and then decided she liked it. Magnif! She said. Logic, I said, <clears throat> clearing my throat, is the science of thinking. Before we can think correctly, we must learn to recognize the common fallacies or problems with logic. These we're going to take up tonight. <gasps> wow! Cool, she said, clapping her hands delightedly. I winced, but went bravely on. <sighs> Polly, first we'll examine the fallacy called the fallacy called oversimplification. By all means, she urged, batting her lashes eagerly. Oversimplification, Polly, means an argument based on a statement that's too simplified. For example, exercise is good, so everybody should exercise. I completely agree, said Polly. Polly, I said gently, the argument is a fallacy. To say exercise is good is too simplified. For instance, if you've just had surgery, exercise is bad, not good. Many people are ordered by their doctors not to exercise until their body recuperates from the surgery. You cannot be oversimplifying. You can't say exercise is good. You have to say exercise is usually good. Or exercise is good for most people. Otherwise, you've oversimplified. You've committed an oversimplification. Do you see? No, she confessed. But this is awesome. Do more. Do more. It'll be easier if you stop tugging at my sleeve, I told her. And when she desisted, I continued. Next, we'll take up a fallacy called hasty generalization. Now, listen carefully. My roommate, Petey, can't speak French. Uh, you can't speak French. I must therefore conclude that nobody at this university can speak French. <gasps> really? said Polly. Nobody can? <sighs> I hid my exasperation as best I could. Polly... It's a fallacy. The generalization is reached too hastily. 
There are too few instances to support such a conclusion. No any more fallacies? She asked breathlessly. This is more fun than dancing, even. <sighs> I fought off a wave of despair. I was getting nowhere with this girl. Absolutely nowhere. Still, I'm nothing if not persistent. I took her home that evening, and we made a date for the next evening at the same time under the old oak. The next night, under the oak tree, I said, Our first fallacy tonight is called appeal to sympathy. She quivered with delight. Listen closely, I said. A man applies for a job. When the boss asks him what his qualifications are, the man says, He has a wife and six children at home. The wife is helpless, and her legs are crippled. The children have nothing to eat, no clothes to wear, no shoes on their feet. There are no beds in the house. The heater isn't working, and winter is coming. A tear rolled down each of Polly's pink cheeks. Well, this is awful, awful, she sobbed. Yes, it's awful, I agreed, but it's no argument. The man never answered the boss's questions about his qualifications, see? Instead, he appealed to the boss's sympathy. He created the fallacy of appeal to sympathy. Do you understand? Have you got a tissue? She blubbered. I handed her a handkerchief and tried to keep from screaming while she wiped her eyes. Next, I said, in a carefully controlled tone, we will discuss false analogy. This is a big one. Now listen, Polly. I think students should get to use their textbooks during examinations. I mean, think about it. Surgeons have x-rays to guide them when they're doing surgery. Lawyers have notes they use to guide them during a trial. Carpenters have blueprints to guide them when they're building a building. So why shouldn't students be allowed to have their textbooks to guide them when they're taking a test? Now that, said Polly, is the best idea I've heard in years. Polly, I said testily, it's a fallacy. The argument is all wrong. Doctors, lawyers, and carpenters aren't taking a test to see how much they've learned. But students are. The situations are completely different, so you can't make an analogy between them. Doctors and students are completely different, so you can't compare them. Don't compare apples to oranges. I still think it's a good idea, said Polly. <sighs> I grunted and groaned, but I pressed on. Next, we'll try hypothesis contrary to fact. Sounds yummy, said Polly. Listen. Philo Farnsworth invented the television. And when he invented the television, he was plowing a field up in Idaho. So we know that if he hadn't plowed that field that day in Idaho, the world would never have had television, right? True, very true, said Polly. Did you see the movie they made about that? Oh, it rocked. But I just love bad Brad Pitt because he's totally my favorite actor. And he did such a good job at that. Polly! If you can forget about the movie for a moment and Brad Pitt, I would like to point out that the statement is a fallacy. Maybe Fido Farnsworth would have invented television at some other date. Maybe somebody else would have invented it. Maybe any number of a million possible things would have happened. You can't start with a hypothesis that's not true and then draw any supportable conclusions from it. They ought to put Brad Pitt in more movies these days, she said. Oh, one more chance, but just one more. I mean, there is a limit to what flesh and blood can bear. Our next fallacy, I said, is called poisoning the well. 
Ooh, how cute, she gurgled. Listen, Polly, two men are having a debate. The first one gets up and says, Everybody, my opponent is a liar. You can't believe anything he's going to say. Now, think, Polly. Think hard. What's wrong? I watched Polly as she knit her brow in concentration. Suddenly a glimmer of intelligence, the first I had seen, came into her eyes. It's not fair, she said. It's not a bit fair. What chance has the first second man got if the first man says he's a liar before he can even start talking? Right! I cried exultantly. 100% right, Polly! It's not fair! The first man has poisoned the well before anybody else could drink from it. He threw his opponent under the bus before his opponent ever got a chance to start. Polly, I'm so proud of you! Hmm, she murmured, blushing. You see, these things aren't so hard. All you have to do is concentrate and think. Come on now, let's review everything we've learned. Fire away, she said with an airy wave of her hand. Heartened now by the knowledge that Polly was not completely an idiot, I began a long, patient review of everything I had told her. Over and over and over again, I cited instances, pointed out the flaws, kept hammering away without let up. It took five grueling nights, but it was worth it. I had taught her to think. I had made a logician out of polyepsy. At last, my work was done. She was finally ready and worthy to be my girlfriend. She was ready to be my wife, a proper hostess, for my many beautiful mansions in the future, and a suitable mother for my children who would be supremely intelligent, much like their father. Now, don't think I didn't love Polly. Oh, no, 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 quite the contrary. You see, I was like a mechanic to Polly, and a mechanic always loves a piece of machinery once he has fixed it. I determined the very next night to tell her of my love. The time had finally come to change our relationship from academic to romantic. Polly, I said when we sat beneath our oak the next night, tonight we're not going to discuss any fallacies. Ah, oh, she moaned, disappointed. My dear, I said, favoring her with my best smile. We have now spent five evenings together. We've gotten along wonderfully. It's clear that we make a good couple. Hasty generalization, said Polly brightly. I beg your pardon, said I. Hasty generalization, she repeated. You just committed a fallacy. How can you say that we make a good couple based on only five nights? I chuckled with amusement. <laughs> she had learned her lessons well. <laughs> My dear, I said, patting her hand in a very tolerant manner. Uh, five dates is plenty, Polly. I mean, after all, you don't have to eat a whole cake to know that it's good. False analogy, said Polly promptly. I'm not a cake. I'm a girl. Don't compare apples and oranges. <laughs> I chuckled with somewhat less amusement. She had learned her lessons perhaps too well. I decided to change tactics. Obviously, the best approach for me was a simple, direct declaration of my strong love. I paused while my massive brain chose the proper words. Then I began. Polly... 
I love you. You're like the whole world to me, and the sun and the stars and the constellations of outer space. Please, say you'll be my girlfriend, for if you won't, I'm afraid my life will be meaningless. I, I won't be able to eat. I'll wander the face of the earth without a purpose in my life. There, I thought, folding my arms. That ought to do it. Appeal to sympathy, said Polly. Urgh, I ground my teeth. I was not like a mechanic, after all. I was more like Dr. Frankenstein, and the monster I had created now had me by the throat. Whew. Frantically, I fought back a tide of panic. I had to keep cool at all costs. Keep cool. Whew. Well, Polly, I said, <laughs> forcing a smile. You certainly have learned your fallacies. I sure have, she said with a vigorous nod. And who taught them to you, Polly? You did. That's right. So you do owe me something, don't you? I mean, if I hadn't come along, you never would have learned about fallacies. Hypothesis contrary to fact, said Polly. I might have learned about them in some other way. In a million of possible ways. I dashed the sweat from my brow. Whew, Polly, I croaked. You mustn't take all these things so seriously. I mean, this is just classroom stuff. You know, the stuff you learn has nothing to do in school. School stuff doesn't have anything to do with real life. Oversimplification, said Polly. A lot of stuff in school has a lot to do with real life. That did it. I leaped to my feet, bellowing like an angry bull. Will you or will you not be my girlfriend? I will not, she replied. Well, why not? Because this afternoon, this afternoon, I promised your roommate, Petey, that I was going to get back together with him. I reeled back, overcome with the infamy of it. After he promised, after he made a deal, after he shook my hand... He's a rat! I shrieked, kicking up a great chunk of dirt. You can't go with him, Polly. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He's a scumbag. He's a rat. Poisoning the well, said Polly. And stop shouting. I think shouting should be a fallacy, too. With an immense effort of will, I calmed my voice. All right, I said. <laughs> You're a logician. Let's think of this thing logically. Okay, how could you possibly choose Petey Birch over me? Look at me. I'm a brilliant student, a tremendous intellectual, a man with a sure future. Look at Petey. He's an idiot, a blockhead, a guy who'll never know where his next meal is coming from. Can you possibly give me one logical reason why you should go out with Petey Birch instead of me? I certainly can, declared Polly. He's got a raccoon coat. <laughs>